Today our grand tour takes us to the last terrestrial planet, Mars. But before we launch this expedition, take a moment to click that red subscribe button below and the bell icon next to it for all the latest Rooftops of America and Rooftops of the Solar System updates. Our journey takes us to the dry, dusty world of the Red Planet. Mars is there, waiting to be reached. Mars, a red eye in the sky, staring back at us. The red planet has long captured the human imagination. Easily spotted at night, it dances across the sky, sometimes following an odd, almost erratic path. These traits influenced how ancient cultures viewed the planet, assigning it with attributions of fire or conflict. The Chinese called it the Fire Star, and its advent heralded grief, murder, or war. The Babylonians named the planet Nergal, and the Hindu Mangala, both deities of war as well. The themes of war and destruction, and the planet's weird little path across the sky, it influenced the Greco-Roman world as well. The Greeks, they called it Ares, after their god of war, and the Roman name was Mars. That weird elliptical path, it still comes up in modern day astrology, Mars in retrograde. But the truth of the matter is a bit more mundane. It's an optical illusion brought upon by the speed of Earth and Mars' revolution around the Sun, and the fact that Mars and Earth don't sit on the same orbital plane. Mars's is slightly canted, sometimes above and sometimes below. Considering the sway that Mars has had on the human mind over the millennia, it really shouldn't be any surprise that it later became science fiction playground. That red hue and the fact that we could see the surface, unlike Venus, made it an ideal location for fantastical stories. And once people actually started looking at the Martian surface in detail, well, what they thought they saw there only fired the human imagination even more. In 1877, Giovanni Schiaparelli looked through his telescope and saw something intriguing and sketched it down. He described what he saw as channels, but they became known as the canals of Mars. Along with this observation was an assumption. If there were canals, then surely that meant there was water. And structures like that meant engineering, and that meant life and civilization. The idea of canals on Mars captured the public imagination, but one man above all the rest, an American astronomer and businessman named Percival Lowell, became fixated on the idea and would go on to study Mars extensively for the next decade and a half to the point where he published three definitive works on Mars and its canals. One of the side effects that this had, though, is Lowell, perhaps more than other astronomers, boosted the image of Mars in the public imagination. This spurred the development of the nascent genre of science fiction, and Mars took on the role of an alternative Earth. Some of the most popular pulp novels were those of Edgar Rice Burroughs, who brought high adventure to the planet with his John Carter series. Another element that really seemed to catch on was the fact that Mars 
was a dying planet and that the civilizations there were getting exceedingly desperate. And this thought actually spurred the development of a whole new line of science fiction, the alien invasion. And the most famous at the time, and still incredibly popular today, was H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. This science fiction bonanza would keep Mars in the forefront of public imagination throughout the 20th century. And it continues even to this day with big budget science fiction movies. While there were doubts about Mars's habitability for Earth type life, even when Lowell was popularizing the idea, that theory actually stuck around in people's minds for decades. It would actually take going there to conclusively shut it down. But even when we found out that Mars wasn't what we thought it to be, it continues to inspire human achievement. Mars has been studied extensively, both from Earth and more recently, on location. Humanity has been sending probes to it since the early 1960s. That said, getting there is a bit of a challenge. Mars has a reputation as a difficult target to reach, with only 40% of probes completing successful missions. Mariner 4 would give us our first real look at the planet. In 1965, when it arrived, it officially became the first probe to fly by and photograph another planet in our solar system. And while Mariner 4 and later 6 and 7 gave us a tantalizing peek at Mars. It wasn't till their youngest sibling, Mariner 9, arrived that we were able to pull back the curtain. Launched in May 1971, it was designed to orbit, map, and collect data of the planet's atmosphere and surface. By November that same year, it became the first spacecraft to successfully orbit another planet. And despite a setback on arrival, of dust storms blanketing the planet, it would produce over 7,000 images and map 85% of the Martian surface before its mission concluded in 1972. These weren't the only early efforts. A few days later, the Soviet Mars 3 mission would arrive, but it would encounter the same hindrance that was currently affecting Mariner 9, the global dust storm. Unfortunately, it would prove much more detrimental for Mars 3. The Soviets were unable to reprogram the probe, so it proceeded on its original schedule, and it launched its lander right into the heart of the storm. It actually managed to touch down safely and communicated for 90 seconds before it was lost, sending only one partial indistinct image. Mars exploration, both in orbit and on the surface, has continued. The first successful soft landing was Viking in 1976, followed by Viking 2 several months later. In 1997, NASA successfully landed the first Mars rover, Sojourner, which in turn has been followed by more complex designs and missions. Today, Mars exploration utilizes the cutting edge of scientific and engineering advancements. At present, Mars' entire population is all robotic, with more on the way. These rovers and landers have solved a few Martian mysteries, but at the same time have uncovered so many more. All this exploration has made Mars seem, well, relatable. Of the planets visited in our solar system, excluding Earth of course, this is the one that seems like it could be in the realm of possibility. While still deadly to humanity, it just doesn't seem as deadly. This frozen desert world has people believing that with just a little hard work, 
we can fix it right up. Mars is on average 142 million miles away from our sun. Just beyond what we call the Goldilocks zone for habitable life. But it does keep pretty regular hours. Day on Mars is only 40 minutes longer than a day here on Earth. And that red hue, that's just iron oxide in the soil. And those blue sunsets, well, they're awfully captivating. And it's close, about 50 million miles away, practically around the corner in cosmic terms. On top of all that, Mars has an atmosphere. And compared to hellish Venus, well, the red planet seems downright homey. Of course, looks can be a bit deceiving. Mars has its own fair share of problems. There's a perchlorate-rich toxic soil, an insubstantial atmosphere made mainly of carbon dioxide, with a pressure 100 times less than Earth, way too low for liquid surface water. And that atmosphere is perhaps the biggest obstacle facing humans on the planet. It's the wrong type and not enough of it. And it does little to help with yet another Martian problem, radiation. Mars has minimal protection from radiation. It doesn't have the bountiful clouds or the magnetic field that you'd find on Venus or Earth. And while it will not be as extreme as, say, Mercury, explorers and high pointers on Mars will constantly be exposed. There is also the temperature to deal with. Much like deserts on Earth, the temperature varies between day and night. And while the temperature extreme is not as drastic as the two closest planets, it is still detrimental to humans. The average temperature for Mars is 81 degrees Fahrenheit, below zero. But this doesn't tell the whole story. A summer day at the Martian equator can be downright pleasant at 70 degrees, above zero. At night though, the temperature plummets drastically well below negative 100 degrees. And that's the summer. In the winter, it's even colder. There are a couple positive steps we can take to mitigate some of this. The biggest one is timing and lining up your visit with the Martian orbit. Mars has a very elliptical revolution around our star, almost as extreme as Mercury's. At present, the Martian solstices line up with the perihelion and aphelion of its elliptical orbit. The orbit Mars takes around the Sun is 687 days long, though its speed varies through it. And this means Martian seasons are a lot more variable than Earth ones. Your best opportunity to visit may well be in the spring or fall particularly since most of the places we want to stop at are located closer to the equator than the poles. This should help manage most of the more drastic bits of the Martian climate and weather, particularly one of its most extreme, dust storms. If there is one thing on Mars that would put any expedition in jeopardy, it would be the red planet's infamous dust storms. And they're an interesting phenomenon, big enough to be seen with telescopes from Earth. Occasionally, they get to the size of continents, blanketing entire sections of the planet. But every couple of years, they grow into super massive world beaters, encircling the globe and lasting for weeks, even months. There is one thing working in your favor though, and that's that low atmospheric pressure. The Martian wind just doesn't have the lift or force as you'd find on, say, in an earth dust or sandstorm. There'll be two challenges that you have to deal with though. The first is the dust. It's electrostatically charged, just like what you find on our moon. So it'll pretty much glom on to anything. The second, and more detrimental aspect, would be visibility. Diminished light as the storm covers the sky and decreased line of sight 
will make navigation much more difficult. Getting lost in the Martian wilderness will be a one-way ticket to an early grave. The good news is the larger storms only seem to happen during summer in the southern hemisphere. So, with good timing, you may avoid the worst of it. There are a few benefits for climbing on the Red Planet. The first is no more power armor pressure suits or thousand degree temperature extremes. You'll be able to get by with a much more flexible and lighter protective suit. The second big thing is that Mars's gravity is less. It's only 38% of what Earth's is, which is going to be very advantageous for the long climbs ahead. The Mars we know today is still a bit of an oddball. It's the second smallest planet, but it shouldn't be. Mars is the could have been, should have been planet of our solar system. Where Earth seemed to catch every lucky break, Mars appears to have been shortchanged at almost every step. It should have been bigger. It should have had life. It had a more substantial atmosphere, but lost it. Its ocean, well, it appears to have been stripped away. What's left is a small planet that's been battered and beaten. So what happened? Well, simply put, Mars found itself in the wrong place at the wrong time and the disadvantage of a next door neighbor who happened to be a bit of a bully. Jupiter's impacted every single planet in our solar system, but its influence on Mars has been particularly rough. As the gas giant made its way to the inner part of the solar system and then later back, it stole most of the material that Mars would have used to become a larger planet. Then later, its gravitational influence flung all sorts of debris to the inner solar system. Once again, Mars just happened to be on the front line. The end result was a planet that was more diminutive in size, being about 53% the size of Earth. But here's a fun coincidence. Because it is a frozen desert world with no liquid surface water, Mars has pretty much the same amount of land available as we have here on Earth. That gas giant influence could have even extended down to the surface itself. One of the absolutely fascinating things about Mars is what's known as the Martian dichotomy. And that's the drastic difference between its northern and southern hemispheres. It's really similar to what we actually find on our moon, where the far side is much more cratered and thicker crust than the near side. The same is on Mars. While the average surface crust is 27 miles, if you look at any topographic map, it quickly becomes evident that it's not uniformly spread. When you split the planet into two halves, the discrepancy is made plain. In the northern hemisphere, the crust is just shy of 20 miles thick, while in the southern, it's just a hair over 36 miles in thickness, a difference of over 16 miles. These two areas can basically be split up into two major types of terrain, the northern plains and the southern highlands. So once again, what happened? Well, that's still a bit of a mystery. There are a couple theories though. Maybe it was caused by impacts, or multiple impacts. Or maybe it was endogenic processes. In other words, the actions in Mars's core or mantle. Regardless, we do know one thing. These two distinct halves came about billions of years ago. Very early in Mars's formation. Despite all this, Mars stokes human imagination as few places in our solar system do. It's mysterious and yet familiar, and that makes it seem like a puzzle we can solve. Reinforcing that perception is that Mars 
may once have been a lot more like Earth than we think. And with that in mind, it's time we get to the surface and start our adventure. Your first big challenge on getting to the surface is actually the descent itself. It's been called the seven minutes of terror. The amount of time it takes from hitting the top of the Martian atmosphere to reaching the surface. The biggest obstacle is, once again, the thin atmosphere. It requires heat shields to get through so you don't burn up, but it isn't thick enough like Earth or Venus to really put the brakes on your speed. You'll have to figure out how to slow the remainder of it in order to touch down safely, whether with rocket-assisted descent, supersonic parachutes, inflatables, or some combination of all of them. Here's a tip though, take note of your total weight, because the more you have, the more difficult it becomes to stop. Once safely on the surface, as you take in your bearings, your first thought may well be how oddly familiar it all seems. Unlike the austereness of Mercury or the hellishness of Venus, Mars has features that look like they could be found on Earth. Part of this familiarity is because some of this landscape was shaped in a similar fashion as Earth's through erosion, both water and wind. Of course, the red planet still has water, whether in the air, or frozen on the poles, or even found frosted on the ground in winter. But its days of liquid water are a faint memory carved into the rocks and geological features of this world. That said, there is enough evidence on the surface to lead to a pretty convincing theory that Mars actually had liquid water on its surface not once, but at multiple times in its history. One of the most striking features of this ancient past is a giant cliff near Ecus Chasma. With a height of almost two and a half miles, liquid water pouring over this could well have made it the tallest waterfall in our solar system. The falls would have emptied into the chasma and then carved out the Kasai Vallis, one of the largest outflow channels on the planet, which in turn eventually drained into the Kreis Planitia. Ikis Chasma and Kase Vallis are just one case of something that Mars seems to do with panache. The red planet does big, I mean extraordinarily big, really, really well. Another great example is one that we can actually see from Earth, and it's that long scar across the Martian middle. Vallis Marineris, in a word, is gigantic. It is over 2,500 miles in length, covering about 20% the circumference of Mars. If you said it in the United States, one end would touch the Pacific and the other the Atlantic Ocean. At its widest part, it is over 350 miles from one rim to the other. The Grand Canyon on Earth is a sight to behold, but you could take a dozen Grand Canyons and fit them in Vallis Marineris and still have room to spare. This amazing canyon is bookended by two distinct landforms. At the eastern end is a jumble of chaotic terrain that also merges into the Kreis Planitia. The shape and layout of this broken landscape suggests that liquid water flowed through here. On the western end is the Noctis Labyrinthus, 
a natural maze of steep walled valleys covered in huge blocks of rock and landslides that runs right into the Tharsis. Valles Marineris is one of the locations that provide evidence of early tectonic activity on Mars. While there is no definitive proof yet on its formation, the most agreed upon theory is that the canyon is a tectonic crack brought on by the creation of the Tharsis Rise, a place we'll be exploring in more depth later. As the crust there heaved upward, it caused such strain and pressure that it literally cracked the surface. Almost like a rock hitting your window shield on one side can send a crack racing across to the other. The canyon was later widened by erosion, mainly wind, but there is evidence on the eastern end that water played a role as well. Not only is this feature long, it's also deep as well. If you were standing on the rim, it is a drop of four miles. If you made it to the bottom and you looked up, you may not even be able to see the rim because of all the fog and cloud cover above you. Near the middle of it, you will find the deepest part of this grandest of canyons. A wide subcanyon called the Milas Chasma is home to the lowest point. As you drop down further, it arguably gets more accommodating for human life. At the bottom, you will be at an elevation of over 16,000 feet below the mean surface level. Here's where things get interesting from a colonization perspective. One of the biggest challenges on Mars is low atmospheric pressure, but the same rules that apply to Venus and Earth also apply there. The lower you go, the more the pressure increases. So, at the very bottom of Melis Chasma, it may well be one of the ideal locations for future human settlement. If you were looking at a map of Mars, there would be several obvious candidates for lowest point. Valles Marineris, of course, but also the wide open lowlands of the Northern Hemisphere. And the heart of this is Utopia Basin, the largest recognized impact crater in the solar system. It has an estimated diameter of over 2,000 miles. Humans first got an up close look at it with the Viking II lander in 1976. The Utopia Basin is one of the major areas in the Martian dichotomy. And with its perched rocks, scalloped terrain, and pingo type features, it's an absolutely fascinating area. Not only that, but evidence points to it having a substantial amount of frozen ice beneath its surface. The same amount that you would find of water in Lake Superior. Its elevation makes it one of the lowest points in the northern lowlands. Interestingly though, if included in a bigger picture, Utopia Basin would be part of the North Polar Basin. Also known as the Borealis Basin, it is the defining land feature of the northern reaches of the planet, making up about 40% of the entire surface. There is a theory that this basin was also formed by impact. If that were the case, then this would easily become the largest known impact area in our entire solar system. The size of the object that hit would have had to have been absolutely massive, just below the threshold of where it would have shattered Mars into pieces. This proposed impact is also tied to another theory, that the collision that created the North Polar Basin launched so much material that it spurred the creation of Mars's two weird little moons 
of Deimos and Phobos. Regardless, if you find yourself standing in the heart of the North Polar Basin, well, you'll be on one of the flattest places in our entire solar system. And while there's a lot of amazing geological and geographical features in the northern lowlands, the one thing that's missing is the Martian low point. It won't be found up here. Instead, surprisingly, it is in the much more hilly and rugged southern hemisphere. Once again, if you look at a map, you'll see the highlands have their fair share of craters. But one stands out more than all the rest. The Hellas Impact Crater is the largest and best preserved impact crater you'll find on the surface of the Red Planet. And like other features we found here, it's absolutely massive with a diameter of 1,400 miles. It's thought to have formed sometime in the late heavy bombardment, about 3.8 to 4.1 billion years ago when either a protoplanet or asteroid smacked right into Mars. What was left behind was also one of the largest impact craters in our solar system. When you are standing on the rim looking out over it, you'll be able to take in the vast expanse of the crater with a drop of over 30,000 feet. This area may hold an amazing secret. If you are taking in your surroundings, you'll find a fair share of clues to deduce what it is. With the lobate debris fields and honeycomb terrain, the Hellas Impact Crater is suspected to have glaciers at the bottom of it. And while that is pretty cool, it isn't unexpected. The real secret is this area may have liquid surface water. Here's why that would be a huge deal. Now we've known for some time that Mars has water, either as water vapor in its atmosphere or frozen as ice at the polar caps. And even, you know, thought to have frozen ice underneath the surface. But liquid water, well, that's a completely different story altogether. When Martian ice melts, it immediately sublimates into water vapor, similar to what carbon dioxide, or dry ice, does here on Earth. But at the bottom of the Hellas impact crater, conditions may just be right for that not to happen. It has to do with something called the triple point. And here's a quick overview on what that is. The triple point is the temperature and pressure where a substance can exist in all three states, solid, liquid, and gas, in equilibrium. Here on Earth at sea level, that's just a fraction of a degree above freezing. The triple point can actually fluctuate depending on pressure, temperature, and even makeup of the water itself. Let's look at the example of boiling water. At sea level, it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But as you move up in altitude, at higher elevations, the temperature for boiling actually drops because there's less atmospheric pressure. Water's triple point is also affected by salinity as well. Salt water, freezes at a lower temperature than fresh. With the conditions on Mars already awfully close to water's triple point, then the right combination of water type, temperature, pressure may exist. The gain of atmospheric pressure by descending several miles may just be enough to tip the balance in favor of liquid water on the surface of Mars. Bring some waders just in case. Because if there is liquid water on Mars, then this is the prime candidate for it. 
and you don't want to find yourself experiencing explosive boiling or slogging through a Martian mud pit on the way to the low point. The actual low point is found in a younger impact crater at the north side of Hellas. Once you travel to the bottom of that, you will be at an elevation of 23,465 feet below the mean surface level, the lowest point on the red planet. Before we venture off into the higher reaches of our journey, there's one other opportunity that's provided because of the drastic difference between the northern lowlands and the southern highlands. And that is the chance to climb mountains with negative elevations. Mars has several of these types of mountains, but if we have to choose only one, then we'll want to head over to Galaxius Mons, which at 13,031 feet below the average surface level is the lowest mountain you can climb on the planet. That said, at the top of it, you may get a fantastic view of the northern plains. As a silver lining, Galaxius Mons is located fairly close to our next destination. This is a Brobdingnagian world for mountains and a golden opportunity for high pointers that's only really found in one other place in our solar system. Mars has many of the solar system's tallest mountains, four in the top 10 alone. So the question is, how did it get so many? Well, part of the answer is the exact same reason that Earth seems to have a cap on how high its mountains can get. You could call it the other side of the coin. The first is gravity. Martian gravity is a lot less, meaning mountains can get bigger before they collapse the crust they sit on. The second is erosion, or lack thereof. Mars doesn't have liquid water, and its winds, while present, aren't nearly as strong as Earth's. Then there is plate tectonics. Earth's plates are always in motion. Mars, though, its tectonic activity appears very limited, any movement having stopped billions of years ago. So while many of the mountains on Mars are the result of volcanic or hotspot activity, unlike, say, the Hawaiian Islands dotting the Pacific Ocean because of a moving plate, on Mars, there is no plate to move. So the magma keeps spilling up on the surface in the same spot over and over, building the mountain taller and taller with each eruption. The end result is giant shield volcanoes. Think of them like Mauna Kea or Mauna Loa on steroids. But the nice thing about these Martian monstrosities is they're more gentle giant than raging juggernauts. And while most of the peaks on Mars are volcanic in origin, there are a couple others that have a decent amount of height that had a different type of origin. And Cirrus Mons sits near the northeastern edge of the Hellas impact crater. It is a massive block of rock that was thrust up to the surface by, as you may suspect, the force of the collision that formed the crater. And while it has slowly eroded over the eons, it still has some substantial height, rising to an elevation of 13,780 feet. Another is Alois Mons, also known as Mount Sharp. This too was created by impact, but instead of being on the rim like Anceris Mons, this one is part of a complex crater formation. Elois Mons rises from base to peak, an elevation of 18,000 feet. You'll find this peak in the heart of Gale Crater. And if it looks familiar, that is because it has been home to NASA's Curiosity rover for the past few years. 
there is one last type of mountain that more research is going to have to be done to see if any exist on Mars of significant height. Thrust and fold type, which is pretty common here on Earth. That said, if any are found, that is yet further proof that at one point in its history, Mars had plate tectonic activity. The first peak we'll tackle on the solar system top 10 list is also the highest point in Elysium. Located on the northwest edge of the Elysium Planitia, this is the second largest volcanic area on Mars. In addition to the volcanoes, it is also home to several other interesting features, such as the Orcus Patera, a long depression of debated origin on the eastern side, and the Athabasca Vallis, thought to be the youngest river valley on the planet. You may also feel a bit of shaking under your feet. Tectonic activity exists on Mars. It's just different than what we find on Earth. And frankly, this really shouldn't be a surprise anymore. Tectonic activity has been different on every terrestrial planet. This part of Mars, though, is tectonically active. Mars quakes have been detected as recently as a few years ago. The principal reason we're here though is to climb the giant mountain that towers over these plains. Elysium Mons rules this part of the world and when you measure it from base to peak it's the third tallest mountain on the planet. But if you take a different style of measure elevation wise from the global surface mean, then it's considered shorter than the Tharsis Montes Trio. As your first major volcano climb on the planet, Elysium Mons is not quite like the others that will follow. While its lower sections are pretty tame, only about 4.5% on average for slope, as you get closer to the top, it shall start to get steeper, up to 10%. That's because Elysium Mons may not be a traditional shield volcano, but a composite one that had several different phases of volcanic activity. For high pointers unable to catch a rocket to Mars, you can actually find a parallel of Elysium Mons on Earth. The volcano Imikusi and the country of Chad. The terrestrial peak has a similar caldera, though it is only one-sixth the size of its Martian counterpart. At the top of the mountain, you'll come across not only a very circular caldera, but also a crater. It's one of the things that gives this peak a bit of a unique look. That crater was probably not caused by impact, but collapse of the mountain itself. At the summit, you'll find yourself at an elevation, 45,000, 479 feet, the fifth highest point on the planet, and also the seventh tallest peak in our solar system. Having finished with Elysium, it is time to head for the biggest of the big, the volcanoes found on Tharsis. This massive dome is also known as the Tharsis Rise. It would be noteworthy even if it was not home to several Martian high points. The dome has a diameter of 2,500 miles and rises up 6.2 miles above the global average. It has a surface area that covers about 25% of the entire planet and is so large and heavy that it affects Mars's rotation. It would easily cover the United States and parts of Mexico and Canada. How the Tharsis came to be is still being determined. But one theory is that it was a result of Mars losing its internal heat. Maybe at one point this was the path of least resistance from the mantle to Mars's surface. There's another theory that goes with it. 
that the Tharsis is actually one massive supervolcano. And if it is, then it would be far and away the largest volcano in our entire solar system. Sitting on top of this gargantuan dome are three gigantic mountains. Peaks so tall that they were some of the only surface features Mariner 9 was able to detect in its initial orbits around the planet while the global dust storm was raging. Their summits rising above the atmosphere. The Tharsis Montes is another clue on Mars's past tectonic activity. The layout of the volcanoes are in an almost straight line and they are all a similar distance from each other. It's just a little bit too perfect to be a coincidence and awfully reminiscent of hotspot volcanoes like the Hawaiian Island and Emperor Seamount chain. If there is a challenge to be had in climbing the giants of the Tharsis Montes, it's going to be found in something incredibly small, dust. These peaks, and Tharsis in general, are incredibly dusty places, and it all has to do once again with that low atmospheric pressure. When this dust is all whipped up in the dust storms, there's enough energy to get it on the slopes, but afterwards, there's not enough density in the wind to remove it. And this is going to cause a couple of problems. The first is it's going to wreak havoc on your protective equipment. That fine particulate matter is going to get everywhere. And we already know it's super sticky. The second challenge is that this has been going on for eons. So the dust has accumulated. There's places they suspect of it being over six feet deep. So you may be wading all the way to the top through dust. And this makes also the challenge of choosing your steps carefully. And compounded on that, a couple of these peaks are thought to be glaciated. So proceed with caution. If you want another warm up, before you tackle the Tharsis Trio, you may wish to check out Alba Mons, an ancient giant on the northern section of the Tharsis Rise, straddling the boundary of the Martian dichotomy. It is the largest known volcano on Mars, covering an area of over 3.5 million square miles. That said, the climb to the top of this ancient rune should be pretty easy. The gradient is, on average, only half a percent. The hardest part may be negotiating the horsed and grabbing terrain on the mountainsides created by the sheer weight of the lava flows. Gaining the summit gets you to an elevation of 22,000 feet. Not only will you have reached the top of the largest volcano on the red planet, but also the solar system. After this though, it's time to tackle the trio. The first peak attempted will be the middle one, the smallest of the trio. Pavanus Mons sits almost equidistant between its two larger counterparts. Small in this case is relative. At over 46,000 feet above the planetary mean surface level, it is still higher than anything on the other terrestrial planets. But its base to peak height is a bit less putting it just outside the top 10 list for tallest peaks in the solar system, coming in at number 13. But you'll still want to climb it for two reasons. The first is because elevation-wise it's the fourth highest peak on the planet, and second, you didn't come all this way to leave one of the Tharsis Montes trifecta unclimbed. One silver lining is Pavanus Mons, is the highest point near the Martian equator, which interestingly enough has made it a popular proposed location for a future space elevator, a role it's already played in science fiction. And while future explorers can, you know, maybe take a couple of stories down to get to the summit, we'll have no such luck this time. 
Climbing Pavanus Mons will be a gentle ascent, with an average slope of only 4%. You will make your way up past the lava tubes on the sides of the mountain until you reach the top. There, you will encounter a deep, complex caldera, with the smaller of the two having a drop of about 3 miles. Standing on the summit of Pavanus Mons will put you at an elevation of 46,000. 939 feet, the fourth highest point on the planet. With one down, we now head southwest, about 250 miles, to Arcea Mons. This mountain is the oldest of the trio, but still one of the younger volcanoes on the planet, and is thought to have erupted as recently as 40 million years ago. Arcea Mons is the largest of the Tharsis Montes. For a point of comparison, the largest shield volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa. Arcea Mons is 30 times larger than Mauna Loa. Climbing up Arcea is going to be pretty similar to the other shield volcanoes we've already experienced. Except in this case, the mountain is kind enough to provide us a guide of sorts. Two long collapsed vents on either side of the mountain that extend all the way from the top down to the base. So, just follow those all the way to the summit. Depending on your direction and the timing of your climb, you may also be treated to another interesting phenomena on the mountain. Arcea Mons is home to the elongated cloud, a weather pattern that forms at the start of the southern hemisphere's winter as the sun heats the air on the mountain slopes and water ice sublimates into water vapor. The cloud can stretch for hundreds of miles. Once you reach the top of the mountain, you shall encounter an amazing sight. An absolutely massive caldera over 72 miles in diameter, formed over 150 million years ago when the magma ran out. The mountain then collapsed in on itself, leaving behind one of the biggest calderas on the planet. Once on top, you'll be at an elevation of 58,330 feet, and you'll be able to check off a bunch of categories. First, you now completed the second of the Tharsis Trio. You'll be able to check off the highest point in Mars's southern hemisphere, and finally, check off the ninth tallest peak in our solar system. From here, it is a 500 mile journey northeast to Azcreus Mons, the most northern and tallest of the Tharsis Montes. Its rumpled appearance makes it stand out compared to its fellow volcanic peaks. The look created by round, overlapping terrace-like structures that circle the mountain. Of all the shield volcano climbs that you're going to take on Mars, this one will be perhaps the most difficult, with an average slope of 7%. Now, the rumpled terrain may provide some challenges to pick your way through, so you might opt to take the smoother lava flows on the northeast and southwest sides of the mountain. Eventually, as you make your way up, you'll reach the summit plateau. The top of the peak sits on a large plateau, and once you crest it, you'll make your way across towards the caldera and the summit. The caldera, a combination of several smaller ones, has an appearance of a four-leaf clover, and each one has a different age, dating back from 100 to 800 million years ago. At the summit of Azcreus Mons, you'll be at an elevation of 59,741 feet. And at this point, you'll have completed the Tharsis Trio. But not only that, the second tallest mountain on the planet, and the fifth tallest mountain in our entire solar system. At this point in our journey, there's only one destination left. Now we travel 750 miles to the west, to the edge of Tharsis, where we'll find the lair of a leviathan. A 
Olympus Mons is gargantuan. But even a superlative like that really doesn't do the size of the mountain any justice. To put this in perspective, the surface area of Olympus Mons is the same as the U.S. state of Arizona. Before you start your climb, you'll want to take in the Olympus Rupees, an escarpment surrounding parts of the volcano. If you look at satellite imagery, these sheer drop-offs are readily identifiable. On the surface, if you were to look at them, they would be massive walls rising up into the sky. These cliffs are some of the more spectacular features that you're going to find on the planet, with some rising up over five miles in height from the volcanic plains below. They were thought to have been formed by a landslide. As the lava rolled down the mountain, it eventually became so great that it exceeded the strength of the very rock itself. Whether you decide to make this an incredibly technical challenge by scaling the cliffs, or take a less extreme route on one of the intact slopes, it is time to start the long journey towards the summit. It's worth reiterating the sheer size of Olympus Mons. It's so big, it's almost difficult to fathom. If you were to stand at the bottom of it and look up, you wouldn't be able to see the summit. Even if you were to move further away, you'd never actually be able to see the summit from the surface. It's literally hidden from view by the curvature of the planet itself. In other words, you don't know you're on top until you're almost on top. And this presents a real challenge, not physically, but psychologically. The rise is so gradual that as you work your way up, you may not even feel that you are increasing your elevation. A comparison would be, say, walking across the state of Kansas or Nebraska, you know, from east to west, slowly gaining an elevation with every step you take. But that's not a fair comparison to those states, because at least there, there's more variation in the terrain and what you're seeing. You don't even get that on Olympus Mons. Fortunately, for all prospective high pointers, Olympus Mons provides a stunning visual cue to alert you that you have reached the summit. The Olympus Mons Caldera is a sight to behold. It is actually a combination of at least six overlapping smaller calderas. It stretches a distance of over 50 miles and has a depth of almost 10,000 feet. As for your summit view, once you turn away from the caldera, and take it all in, well, you may be a bit underwhelmed. Because even though you're on the rooftop of the planet, as you look out to the horizon, all you're going to see is more Olympus Mons. In some ways, it would be similar to standing on a high point in the Great Plains or Russian steppes. A broad expanse of relatively flat land stretching off beyond the horizon. But if you look up, then you may well have one of the best planetary star views in the entire solar system. Regardless, coming in at 69,841 feet, you're going to find yourself on the rooftop of Mars. But not only that, it's the tallest mountain and tallest volcano on any planet, and the second tallest mountain in our entire solar system. With our ascent of Olympus Mons finished, we can now take heart in completing the first part of our grand tour, high pointing the terrestrial planets and getting a good start on a secondary objective climbing the top 10 tallest peaks in our solar system.
With our high pointing adventures in the inner solar system now complete, it's time for us to chart a course to a new Jotunheim. As our grand tour takes us to the realm of giants beyond the frost line. I'm Scott Mar Thaler. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Rooftops of America. Before you go, click that red subscribe button below, and I'll see you soon.